Thank you very much, Dennis. That, uh, that flood happened 174 years ago. Um, and I was so impressed with this generosity, and it had a profound impact. And I hope, uh, I mean, Liz's life in general has had a profound impact on my life in so many ways. And I hope to communicate that very vividly over the next half hour or so. Let me just tell you briefly uh, about the structure of this afternoon's event. Um, I will hopefully give an engaging lecture for the next 30 minutes or so, and then I will take a few minutes backstage at which you please feel free to stand up and stretch, and then I'll be coming back and performing the uh, E minor sonata. So let me first of all define a few terms. Um, and the title of the lecture, Listed Across Music as Sacred, in the B minor sonata. So for purposes of this lecture, I will define sacrament as a physical manifestation of divine energy. Liszt believed that music and art served a type of sacramental function, allowing the listener to mystically experience the divine. Now it's important, uh, many have a misconception about Liszt uh, and they feel that he kind of found religion late in life after so many other things didn't quite work out. Um, that's definitely not the case. Very early on, this had very, very powerful spiritual impulses and actually pleaded with his father when he was 16. Uh, he asked his father if he could become a Roman Catholic priest because that was what he had wanted to do all for his first 16 years on the planet. And this was the response of his father, Adam. The path of a true artist does not lead away from religion. It is possible to have one path for both. Love God, be good and upright so that you will reach ever higher in your art. Now, this whole uh, lecture and this topic has always been fascinating to me, but it took on a whole new dimension when I visited uh, Budapest for the first time. How many have been to Budapest? Wonderful city, isn't it? So gorgeous. I take a group of students there every other summer. Uh, so if there are any uh, students out there that play the piano, you have to be able to play the piano as a requirement. Um, I would be more than happy to take a Budapest and piano in Salzburg in the summer of 2013, I think it's the next time I'll be away. But anyway, I uh, visited the Liszt Museum for the first time, and I knew that it had contained um, you know, all kinds of interesting things that I wanted uh, to see from Liszt. But what fascinated me most was they reconstructed his bedroom. And as you can see, um, I thought this was also printed in your handout, what I was amazed was how physical Liszt's approach to his own spirituality was. For example, he has this beautiful prayer school uh, where he would pray through his morning and evening prayers. On the prayer school, there was a very, very beautiful crucifix, and around the crucifix, as you might imagine, was a very, very beautiful rosary. But what I was most interested in was the icon that this has right above the crucifix. It's a very traditional icon. It's also very traditional in the Orthodox tradition. It's the Christ made without hands uh, icon. This was presumably the image that was um, imprinted on the towel that, was, that the Saint Veronica wiped Christ's uh, face with as he was on his way to the crucifixion. And so it was very clear that this spirituality had a significant amount of physical manifestations. And this went along perfectly with the study that I had just begun of the role of iconography. And I'm quoting from one of those books. Now these, by the way, all of the quotes and the references are on the back of your handout uh, in the bibliography. Mankind is a sacramental being by nature and needs the instrumentality of both sacraments and symbols to attain communion with the invisible. Now this is what Liszt himself had to say. Um, one of my dearest friends on the planet, Alan Walker, wrote a tremendous three-volume biography of Liszt. And so if any of you are, if I have prompted your interest in any way, shape, or form, um, I would certainly direct you to that wonderful uh, biography of Liszt. And these following quotes are from there. Art for Liszt was God made manifest. It ennobled the human race 
Insofar as the artist was a bearer of the beautiful, he was like a priest ministering to his congregation. And I've used this priestly metaphor quite often in my teaching. Um, so when I encourage my students to basically retreat to the practice room and practice the scales, their arpeggios, their exercise, I want them to kind of think that they're kind of almost in a monastic retreat, perhaps even preparing for the priesthood. Um, it has failed miserably as a pedagogical tool. I have a feeling I'm one of those very few types that it would have inspired to even greater scale speed. This is another quote from the Alan Walker biography. Music for Liszt was the voice of God. He often behaved as if music possessed healing property. Because of its divine origin, he seemed to say mere exposure to it was a spiritual ball. And this is List himself writing about what he felt the role of music was. Is not music the mysterious language of a faraway spirit world whose wondrous accent at one within us wakened us to a more intensive life? And this connection between music and mystery I found most compelling and interesting. And it also corresponded with a fascinating study I was doing, um, a part of which was reading the uh, book of this man, this is Bishop Calisto Suer. The idea of embracing this language, the mis mystery of faraway spirit world. And Bishop Calisto writes about the true nature of Christianity. We see that it is not the task of Christianity to provide easy answers to every question, but to make us progressively aware of a mystery. And this is exactly the role of the icon in historical uh, Christian theology, uh, doing exactly what Liszt believed music did. And I quote from Bishop Pulisos again, the icon serves a mediatory function between God and man and reveals a, mystically reveals the meeting place between heaven and earth. And likewise, this is list writing about that same meeting place. Art is heaven on earth, to which one never appeals in vain when faced with the oppressions of this world. And this leads us to the, the one of my favorite Greek theologian, St. John of Damascus, and making this connection between music and iconography, what amazed me was that when St. John was writing about the icon, he often used musical terms to describe its topic. And this is St. John writing in his wonderful book on the divine images, it is a song of triumph, a revelation, and an enduring monument to the victory of the saints and the disgrace of the demons. So what I will argue is that the B minor sonata can be best understood as an aural icon. And let me explain further exactly what I mean by that. For me, the most compelling argument for the idea of a program that the B minor sonata might actually be more than just an absolute uh, piece of music, an absolute uh, um, piano sonata, is this idea of the cross mode. And this is Liszt's own words describing what he thought the cross mode does. Liszt himself identifies what he calls the theme of the symbol of the cross. At the end of the full score of his oratory of the legend of St. Elizabeth, this was computed in 1862. And he quotes two Gregorian melodies that begin with these same three notes, the Magnificat and the Crux Fidelis. He then identifies several works that use this cross mode and said that among others was Hunenschlag, who we'll be talking about in a minute, the Magnificat from the Dante Symphony, the Gloria from the Missum Solemnis, and the March of the Crusaders from Elizabeth. Many scholars, including myself, but I'm not a piano not a scholar, um, believe that he, among others, must refer to the Sonata, the only other work this did written by 1862 that clearly utilizes the cross mode. Now, this is the cross mode uh, down here at the bottom. And one of the works that he identified as using the cross motive was Hunisch. 
Shabbat, or the Battle of the Hunts. It's a very, very wonderful tone poem that this wrote. And this is what he writes about the function of Hunan Shabbat. In the middle of the picture appears the cross and its mystic light. On this my symphonic poem is founded. The chorale, Crux Fidelis, which is gradually developed, illustrates the idea of the final victory of Christianity in its effectual love to God and man. And this is the painting upon which this base is tone poem. And we can see up in the corner the mystical light of the cross emanating amidst this horrific battle. Now this is the actual chant, the Crux Fidelis chant. Um, some of you may know that I have a second life as a Greek Orthodox proto salvi or head chanter. And so I get to chant in wonderful, beautiful languages every week. This is the only time I get to sing in Latin, however. Um, I'd like to go ahead and sing the Crux Fidelis for you and show you how this utilizes this. This is a hymn that is sung on Holy Friday. Crux Fidelis is translated the faithful. Crux fidelis in terrones, alborum ad nobilis, nulla lentera proper, from de flore termine, dulce inum dulce amo, now the important notes out of that Gregorian jam are the first six. Because those are in fact the first three notes of the cross mode. Now Liszt wrote many other works that utilize the cross mode. Um, the work Via Crucis or the Way of the Cross is Liszt's musical setting of the 14 station. And as you can see, right at the very end, but well, at the beginning of the piece, the cross mode is very, very happy. But also at the end, as the choir sings, um, and then we have in the, uh, uh, in the piano part, simply stated the cross theme. So it's very clear that when Liszt uses these intervals, that it has a very specific programmatic function. So let's talk about how Liszt uses that chant, the cross mode, in the D-Mark Sonata. This is the second theme of the sonata. Christ on top of the mountain. I'm not sure if you can make out the three apostles, Peter, James, and John. 
Um, they do what most of us would do when in encounter with the divinity, is they just kind of go crazy and fall uh, down flat. Um, but it's really what I feel happens from a musical standpoint every time that the crossbow enters throughout the course of the sonata. Now, Richard, Richard Wagner certainly understood this idea of the crossbow because he swiped the idea from Liszt for his final opera. This is the uh, theme of the Holy Grail for Parsifal. Characteristic 
of that second theme is this idea of a relentless, repeated note. And you will hear later on in the piece that this transforms that Because many composers have dwelt on this idea of a relentless repeated note. Perhaps the most famous example would be what Beethoven uses in his Fifth Symphony, the idea of this relentless knot of fate that Beethoven uses to, to, basically to develop his entire Fifth Symphony. Liszt does the same thing. Now, about a third way through the piece, you're going to hear a very, very abrupt uh, stop, uh, cessation of musical energy. And then we have the crossing that comes back in a very dark key C sharp minor. Progression went as follows. 
It started off with lament, followed by prayer, then struggle, and struggle is what the few always represented. And then finally, triumph. So if this is in fact the case of the minor sonata, then what does Liszt use to symbolize prayer? goes through this divine key of F sharp major and has that most glorious melody. So we see that in the sonata, we have the same exact psychological progression that exists in all of Liszt's work that deals with the um, the Fugato uh, sections. This, thing, this second theme, this beautiful prayer theme, also has a lot of similarity to a consolation of and he marks in that particular piece cantabile con devozione so it has clearly devotional quality in that particular context I want to talk a little bit about the end of the sonata um, there are many arguments for the existence of God on various different levels. My argument is this page right here. The X's on there are clear, it's clear evidence for me at least of divine intervention. This was Liszt's first attempt at the sonata. And rather than the transcendently beautiful and poignant ending that it ended up with, it was going to end with triple fortissimo tremolos which would have been the most possible cheesiest way to end this profoundly beautiful piece. So thank God those exes intervened and changed his mind. So he, uh, as you would expect, there is this very beautiful, triumphal return of the cross name, triple forte, B major, everything is right for the world. And then it simply ended there. What Liz decided to do with his revised ending was he, first of all, had the triumphant cross name. Then he decided to recapitulate the prayer thing. Remember, the prayer thing happened in his divine key of red sharp major, and of course it's going to be recapitulated in E major, which we've never heard it, so we get to hear that theme in the, uh, in the home key. But what's most fascinating he decides, after the thing that all is finished and is done with the universe, he decides to bring back the Satan thing. Uh, to those that, that 
listen to it and those that are lucky enough to be able to play it. So what I think this is really trying to do, and what I'm trying to do, is not answer every analytical question you may have about why this thing that is here, or why this thing that is there, but really I believe that it is LISC's most important function to simply make us progressively aware of a mystery. Thank you.